Dear colleagues, I would like to open the plenary session and uh, this time I would like to emphasize that the Researchers Excellence Network is the network of um, our researchers all around the Europe and the world and we are very happy that we can cooperate together with Regina for this conference and to give this opportunity for our members to review records, to know more about humanities and arts. So today we will have four plenary session presentations. Uh, our presenters are from Latvia, Lithuania and Croatia. So it will be an international uh, plenary session. We are very happy about this. And we will ha have part of presenters in the room and part online. So it will be hybrid mode as well. Uh, we would like to emphasize that we would be really happy and would appreciate if you would keep your microphones muted while others are speaking. And uh, we would like to, uh, you to open your microphone when you will have a question, because we will have the questions and discussions part two. So if you have some questions, do not hesitate to raise the hand after presentations. Uh, I will try to moderate all the uh, session and to be sure that your questions are here. And in the very end, after all presentations, if you don't uh, uh, have possibility to ask by word, you are always welcome to give your questions in the chat line because we are able to read them to our presenters. So I would like to uh, invite our first key speaker of this plenary session, Dr. Yuris Tsiganovs from Latvian War Museum in Latvia and professor will give us a very interesting presentation about uh, military aspects. I guess this is very relevant topic and uh, I hope that Dr. Yuris will give us very um, interesting insights from your research. So dear colleague, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning for everybody, their colleagues, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I am very glad to be here because I think that uh, online era and um, and um, web era is a very good. Uh, this is these are the very good things, but uh, the personal presentation is a very important for for connecting, for, for, uh, for, uh, for partnership uh, between colleagues and, and others. Um, my presentation is about military aspect in the security system of Latvia and the Baltic states in the, inter, in the interwar period. And uh, in this time, in nowadays, I think it's a very important because the next war is uh, not so uh, far away from, from ours from our region uh, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, the state military doctrines for the Latvian army in the interwar period was developed after the end of the war of independence. However, this war could not be used as a model for the development of Latvia's military strate strategic defense doctrine. From this war, during which the Latvian army uh, won Latvia's freedom, one could draw only spiritual strengths, but not many military lessons. By 1940s, technological, tech, technological progress in, in the field of armament had advanced rapidly. The war of independence was mostly fought with the light infantry weapons, rifles and machine guns, but now, in, that means in, in the interwar period, in, it had become more complex. Armament was expensive and it was almost impossible uh, for small countries to complete with the uh, superpower due to limited resource. The Latvian military doctrine was based on the idea of a, of a defensive war. Considering the geopolitical doc conditions of Latvia, means small territory, relative dense, branched with networks of domestic railways and roads the country's agri agrarian nature and its location in an unsafe geopolitical space. 
the idea of a defensive was uh, defensive war was justified by the one of the most prominent Latvian military specialist general Hugo Rosenstein, who outlined his views in um, uh, 1932 article titled "The Military Geography of Latvia." Against the superior battle equipment, tanks, and aircrafts of the potential enemy, it is uh, necessary to use sufficiently effective and cheap defensive tactic, anti-tank weapons and anti-tank anti-aircraft artillery, which while mobilizing our strength, both of physical and economic, as well as moral. Even though military theorists were quite active in supporting this idea, the uh, response from the government came too late. Conceptually, the high command of the Latvian army planned to resist any potential aggressor. It was indeed intended to defend the territory of Latvia until the Western powers interested. This was the foreign policy activities, which were aimed at trying to find the collective security options. In the case of war, the uh, allocation and mobilization of all possible forces was planned. By 1939, four mobilization plans were, de were developed. According to the force mobilization plan, which came into force in 1988, uh, sorry, it was planned to increase the number of infantry division to seven, with a total of uh, 21 infantry regiments, as well as to form additional technical combat unit. In, a ter in the terms of time, Seven, uh, 72 hours or three days were foreseen for full mobilization. Foreign observers estimate that, uh, that in the event of war, Latvia could potentially mobilize at maximum of 180,000 to 200,000 military trained men including 17,000 no reserve, 17, reserve non-commissioned officers and 100 reserve officers. The strategic section of the army staff of Latvia's army established, is estimated at wartime army only 130,000 to 135,000 men. Latvia's leading military experts con considered the Soviet Union to be the main potential enemy, although Germany's growing aggressive tendencies also began to raise serious concern at the end of the 1930s. The National Defense Plan, developed in 1937, uh, provides three options. Option A, defense against the attack of the Soviet Union from the east. Option D, defense from the uh, southwest in the event of the event of the Germany attack. A means in Latvian Austrumi means uh, east, and D means in Latvia means DNVD means uh, south. And option K in Latvian uh, letter K uh, start from the from the word kopēs, uh, defense against both of potential aggressors. At the time, two infantry divisions, Zemgale and Latgale, were stationed in near Latvia's eastern borders. The station place of the Zemgale division was Daugavpils. The cavalry regiment, as well as the separate units of the uh, aviation regiment and auto tank brigade, were also stationed here. The whole, the wall uh, with the division was stationed in Riga along with the auto tank brigade. Heavy Artillery Regiment, Anti-Aircraft Regiment, Aviation Regiment, Signal Battalion, as well as the Mine Squadron of the Naval Fleet, uh, with warships Virsaiti, Simanta and Vestors. The units of the Kurzemet Division, except for the Sarci Jalgava Infantry Regiment, were at Liepāja along with the submarines Ruonis and Spīduola, the support ship Varuonis and the 8th Naval Aviation Squadron. Uh, the distribute of troops showed in the that the state was accepting a hostile attack from the eastern neighbors, the Soviet Union, although the army forces were also looking with uh, suspicion at Germany. The distribution of Latvian army was criticized 
by General Rudolf Bangerskis. He wrote that for the sake, the sake of austerity, several divisions were concentrated in the three cities, Riga, Liepai and Daugopils, and compacted in a few barracks. The Zemgala division and the cavalry regiment were in the partic partic particularly dangerous situation. Both were in a narrow and uncomfort uncomfortable Daugopils fortress, which had only two exits. It was also a wrong step to concentrate all army, uh, all Latvian army artillery units at the Struopi near Daugopils training grounds during summer exercise. In the case of sudden mobilization, the artillery regiment would have to their permanent location. Uh, Kurzemes artillery regiment to Liepaja, Vidzeme artillery regiment, heavy artillery regiment, coastal artillery regiment and the armor and trains regiment to Riga, the Zemgal artillery regiment to Kruspils and the Zemgal artillery regiment would remain in Daugopils. So, there would be an uh, unsinkable mess. In addition, most of the artillery ammunition starhouse were located in the Struopin near Daugopils training ground. Near, near the border, until the mid of 1930s. Uh, in the means that the single successful attacks on enemy aviation could destroy the entire reserves of the Latvian artillery, as well as the whole Zemgale division dropped in the Daugavpils fortress. The situation began to change in the mid 1930s, when the ammunition reserves were gradually, gradually transferred to the new built Zakula storehouse near the Riga. On September 1, 1939, when the Second World War began with Germany's attack on Poland, General Martin Schartmann, as the chief of staff of the Latvian army, sent out of the order to immediately stop all, all uh, furloughs and foreign foreign travels, officers and soldiers had to return to their units. The relocation of officers was urgently carried out. Several categories of reservists were called up for service. The army was in alarm state and these measures were related to the poss possible start of mobilization in case Latvia's, Latvia was invaded. However, the realization of uh, the outcome of a future war will not be uh, decided on a battlefield alone come too late for the leadership on the Latvian army and state. It was necessary to prepare for the war in advance in both of the fields of the military and the economy. Colonel Arthur Silgales noted that the getting the army ready requires strategic approach and uh, forward thinking Policy that should be not guided to feelings, sympathies, historic, historical rights, illusions, or personal ambitions, but only by the real necessities. Ne necessities. On August 23, 1939, in a pact was signed between the Stalinist Soviet Union and Naz Hitler's Nazi Germany's, Germany, where be the two great powers divided Eastern Europe between them. The Baltic states had to uh, sing a mutual assistance pact with the Soviet Union, which put them in the roles of the Soviet protectorate. Latvia singed the agreement on October 5, 1939. According to the agreement, the Soviet Union accurated to, uh, the right to the bring in a 25,000 men strong Red Army contingent in the territory of Latvia and station them in military base in Kurzeme. On May 1st, 1940s, 40, there was already 21, about 21,000 soldiers in the Soviet base in the territory of Latvia. These bases were at Liepāja, Ventspils and the districts from the west coast of the Vent River. Following the deployment of the Red Army troops in Latvian territory, the high command of the Latvian army left, lifted the increased combat red, uh, redness at the beginning of September. On November 1st, following an order of the Minister of War, the Kala preservists were retired. However, the leadership of the Latvian army, despite the promise made by the most promission, uh, promission and politi politicians 
uh, was uh, aware the sooner or later hostile, hostilities can take place in the country's territory. The establishment of Soviet military base in Kurzeme required the uh, relocation of army units and the redrafting of mobilization plans. Uh, state defense plans were developed in sec uh, secrecy. The previous mobilization plan uh, was not useful because uh, it uh, could not be enforced in the districts already controlled by the, by the Soviet Army, by the Red Army. In October, November 1939, uh, uh, the fixed mobilization plan was developed. It provided for the distributions of troops in uh, such a way from wood facilities, the capture of uh, both of the Vanta and, uh, Vanta and Peded's Ibex to Lubana lines in the event of war, fighting against the Soviet garrison in Kurzeme and the main Soviet forces in the Latvian USSR border. The plan was mobilized and formed three new infantry divisions with nine infantry regiments, three artillery regiments, two additional regiments, and three cycling, uh, cycling battalion. These units were to be formed in Riga, Cesis, and Pljavinis. Under favorable conditions, the mobilization would be carried, uh, carried out within uh, 29 hours, and within three days, the army would theoretically be on the main battle line. The number of men available uh, for mobilization was estimated to be around 130,000 to 135,000, and it was anticipated the, the, that the eastern border would be not to held for long because the number of covering units and border guards was uh, not enough, so mobilization might not be possible in some summer years. With the uh, establishment of Red Army base in the Western Kurzeme, the Latvian armies maneuverably become more limited. Therefore, the IVX line, line played an important role in the tactical plans. On February 22, 1940s, the cabinet of ministers and uh, the cabinet of ministers, Latvia's cabinet of ministers, extended uh, the during of compulsory military service to 18 months instead of the previous 12 to uh, 15 months. However, the Latvian heads of states understood too late that all citizens and all resources should be part of the country's defense. Only on May 1st, 1940, uh, the love of national defense was passed, which included all location, all local government institutions, civil institutions, chambers, organizations, companies, as well as all citizens and the uh, Latvian armed forces. Uh, such term was not used prior to this. Under the law of national defense, the armed forces consist uh, of following parts. The army, which included land forces, air forces, and the navy, uh, subordinated to the minister of war. The border guard brigade, subordinated to the minister of interior. The Latvian ice guards organization, subordinated to the minister of public affairs. State and Prime Minister Karl Sumans became the Supreme Commanders in Chief of the Armed Forces as well as the head of the state's defense. On June 1, on June 1st, 1940, the Latvian army consists of about 2,000 officers, sanitary officers and administrative officers, uh, 27 and half thousand deputy officers, non-commissioned officers and soldiers, a total of about uh, 20, uh, 29 and a half thousand men. Uh, with the addition of contract workers, the army had a total of 30,000 and uh, more men. The Latvian heads of state hoped an, of, for an international guarantee and Latvia's neutrality, neutrality policy. However, the reality was different. Western countries were too far away uh, and um, safeguarding Latvia independence was not a foreign policy priority for them. 
It would be a logical to assume that all three Baltic states would work together to strengthen their national defense, thus forming a significant strategic strength. Theoretically, a total of five and a half million citizens lived in the Baltic states in an interwar period. This allowed it to mobilize an army of uh, uh, 615,000 men, although in reality there would be uh, 300,500 men, uh, 100,000 in Estonia, 130,000 in Latvia, and 130,000 in Lithuania. This would be a significant force. However, uh, there was no joint defense plans for Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia. There was no consensus among the Baltic states, and they did not cooperate uh, either politically or, or military. In addition, uh, the authorian, authority and leaders of the Baltic states did not like each other. Only Latvia and Estonia conclude a military union agreements of 1921, 1932, and 1934, which remained on the paper. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Yuris, for your interesting presentation. Now we would like to invite the second presenter. We will have uh, our colleague, Professor Ina Druviete from Latvian Language Institute, University of Latvia. And she will give us a very interesting presentation about promoting positive language attitudes and international indigenous languages. So, Professor, the floor is yours, and uh, we are waiting uh, with the excitement for your presentation. Good morning uh, from Riga. Thank you very much uh, for uh, this chance to participate uh, in uh, your remarkable conference online. I regret very much not being with you this morning, but so let's use uh, modern technologies. So, uh, first of all, are we indigenous languages? Uh, why uh, such a title? So, uh, I'll give a short introduction. Um, we have a state uh, program, uh, the Latvian language, and uh, our team uh, analyzed uh, the phenomenon of language attitudes. Uh, first of all, uh, language attitudes towards uh, our uh, mother tongue and uh, the official state language, the Latvian language. As you all know very well, uh, we have got uh, considerable success in uh, formal functions of restoring uh, Latvian, so it's uh, almost obligatory in all uh, state-funded institutions, uh, almost obligatory in education, uh, but we have some problems concerning the use of Latvian in informal unofficial relations. And uh, despite of governmental efforts, uh, we still need some improvement on language attitudes uh, among uh, uh, the titular population. And uh, therefore, uh, our conclusion that uh, in order to promote more positive language attitudes towards the Latvian language, we have to inform society about general sociolinguistic processes, about uh, situation in global lingua diversity, and uh, to show the vulnerability of language languages, even of those uh, having status of the official language and uh, a considerable number of speakers. Uh, therefore, uh, uh, I'm going to tell you about some ideas how we can use the international decade of indigenous languages in order to promote the Latvian language and to do it uh, in a national, regional and individual so, here you'll see this foggy picture about the opening of this international decade of indigenous languages in Latvia, in Mazirbe, two months ago. 
Uh, yes, uh, our Livonian colleagues were among initiators of this uh, decade and very actively participants in uh, all processes uh, concerning this global initiative. We had year 2019 as the International Year of Indigenous Languages and now it has been transformed into International Decade of Indigenous Languages uh, pronounced by the United Nations and UNESCO. The main goals are not only to protect the individual languages, and we all know that almost half of our uh, languages in a global scope are so-called endangered languages, but also to create awareness of the importance of linguistic diversity and multilingualism. So all uh, persons uh, living in the countries, living uh, uh, in our cities or countrysides, uh, irrespective of their personal experience, simply have uh, 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 to have some information about local lingual diversity and about the importance of cultural diversity and uh, biodiversity. And therefore, uh, we have to develop uh, uh, common uh, goals uh, how to promote this idea of language protection, uh, how to develop uh, positive language attitudes, and all uh, these ideas are already included in this global action plan of the International League of Indigenous of course, we know that there are some stereotypes that indigenous languages are mostly scriptless languages spoken uh, uh, by a small part of uh, the populations of a country. So sometimes it's uh, not so easy uh, to get education in these languages. And therefore, when we speak about indigenous languages, we usually uh, show pictures you see on the screen. But uh, the coin has other side. Here you see uh, people like all of us, they are also indigenous people. Uh, Frisian people, Cornish people and our Livonians. And therefore it's very important to stress that if we use the term indigenous people, we speak about autochthonous populations uh, of uh, countries, usually about languages having no status of the official language or having such a status simply for symbolical reasons and uh, such an enlargement of the scope for indigenous people as I'll uh, uh, try to show you could be beneficial not only for uh, protection of our autochthonous small languages but also for Latvian and uh, therefore, this global action plan adopts a broad approach, not restrictive approach towards indigenous languages. And um, indigenous languages uh, have been described as the languages currently or historically used and considered integral to their heritage, knowledge systems or identity. And last but not least, these indigenous languages are usually recognized in the member states' uh, legislation. Uh, in most of cases, some language-related laws and policy frameworks exist. And um, uh, in uh, the best case, countries allocate considerable financial, institutional and human resources in order to promote uh, the use of these languages in economic, legal and political domains. And the idea of this decade is uh, to promote uh, both legal protection, use in education and positive language attitudes towards these languages. Some words about this opening event uh, of uh, the language decade in uh, Mazi. 
Uh, you uh, see the United Nations coordinator of this uh, decade in Garta Kaczynskaya of the work, so every high level UNESCO official took part in this event. The event uh, has been opened by our Minister of Education and our Minister of Culture, um, as well as the representatives uh, from uh, municipalities, universities, uh, NGOs, and so on. And you still uh, can visit this exhibition at uh, Mazirbe and uh, see uh, the idea, the global idea, uh, and the way how it has been implemented in our Ukrainian society. Why I speak so much about the Baltics? Because uh, when speaking about the Baltic states, uh, this language is clearly among uh, the indigenous languages uh, developed within this decade. There are some discussions about settled language in Estonia, up to now, no discussions about the uh, Lithuanian languages, languages spoken in Lithuania, but we speak about uh, Livonian as autochthonous language in Latvia. Some words about the place of the Livonian language in Latvian linguistic landscape. Uh, here you see uh, uh, some uh, part of uh, so-called preamble of the Constitution of Latvia. Uh, our preamble has been adopted in uh, 2014 and uh, it's quite long and by the way it mentions the Latvian language for three times. It's unique case uh, in the world and you see that also live traditions uh, have been mentioned in this preamble. We have some legal uh, uh, articles showing the place of Livonian in our uh, language policy already in the first law on languages adopted uh, already in 1989, but the present law on languages also states that the live language is the language of the in indigenous or autochthonous population and uh, it's not a foreign language uh, uh, within the meaning in this law recognized in our country. Uh, the story about uh, the protection and Livonian language in Latvia uh, uh, is another one, uh, an issue for another paper, but my goal is to show how we are trying uh, to uh, inform about the Livonian language in order to provide this broader room to global lingua diversity and multilingualism. And therefore, we are very proud that uh, uh, three um, years ago, we founded the Livonian Institute, uh, and it's the only scientific institution in the world who is focused entirely on modern and wide-ranging studies into topics relating to the Livonians. Here you see uh, some books published uh, both by the Livonian Society and the Livonian uh, Institute. And I could say that uh, the Livonians could serve as a role model how to involve modern technologies uh, in uh, language studies. Uh, their homepage, uh, Livonis Net, informs us that uh, it's uh, possible to apply uh, this uh, general framework for or, uh, reference uh, concerning language proficiency, how it's possible to develop electronic dictionaries, and uh, how uh, to disseminate knowledge about their language and their activities. And uh, previously I demonstrated you the pictures of uh, uh, Frisian people, Cornish people, and our Livonians. All these uh, three uh, autochthonous languages in the respective countries together is carrying uh, on a project within uh, the uh, European framework of cultural heritage. But 
why we are so concerned about silly birds? Of course, because this language is a special treasure for the world, but we have another reason too. So, we know uh, that uh, despite of uh, the official language status and our efforts to promote use of Latvian, uh, we still have uh, no the sense of security, especially no. And therefore, we fully agree um, uh, to director of the Livonian Institute of Edge Trades as for Livonians as a miniature model of the Latvians in terms of society as well as language. And the only difference is found in numbers. And the developments of the Livonians up to the point where we find ourselves now shows that nature of the, that process, namely assimilation, very well. And therefore, uh, we have a research question developed further. Will Livonian experience become a source for changes in thinking and attitudes towards Latvian? So, does it help us to appreciate the role of our language? And uh, the, uh, the revival of re Livonia may be uh, in favor for the long-term maintenance of Latvian. And we are going to use the international decade of indigenous languages in order to promote all languages. And of course, uh, it's uh, included in the guidelines of our language policy, and we have to assume the responsibility for protection and development of the Latvian language. And of course, the same is true for Lithuania in Lithuania and Estonian in Estonia. As for language attitudes, uh, we know that we can treat language from different perspectives. So we can speak about language as a means of communication. We can treat it as an economic asset, maybe simply a part of global cultural and linguistic heritage, but we can treat our language as a symbol of national and individual identity. And therefore, we have to find the great right mechanisms, uh, both in national and regional level, how to promote uh, the last treatment of a language, language as a symbol of national and individual identity. And therefore, we may use the activities within the international decade of indigenous languages to develop positive language attitudes also in favor of national languages. All languages matter, of course, not only big ones, not only endangered ones, also so-called mid-sized ones. And in order to maintain them, we need well-considered system of language policy. It concerns so-called small official languages. We know uh, that uh, taking into account the number of speakers, neither Latvian nor Lithuanian nor Estonian, are not small languages. Uh, we are among uh, 200 uh, biggest languages out of 7,000 languages in the world. But uh, in fact, we are not protected neither by market forces as so-called big international languages, nor by international declarations, charters and conventions as minority languages and uh, uh, indigenous languages. And events uh, during last months demonstrates us the fragility of uh, even languages with high number of speakers very well. And therefore, uh, we uh, consider that the term indigenous languages, at least in some cases, may be applied to the small and mid-sized autochthonous European languages. And uh, therefore, at least theoretically, discussions about Latin, Lithuanian, and Estonian um, are possible. And the United Nations recognized that the, that the identification of indigenous people has been a process of extended policy discussion.
discussions, we are going to participate. At the very end, there are not only military, not only economic, uh, not only political, but also linguistic consequences uh, of uh, Russia's invasion into Ukraine. One of the results is linguicide, or purposeful is the extinction of the Ukrainian language. Uh, the ombudsman of Ukrainian language, they have such an institution, are publishing information lists called Stop Linguocid about uh, linguocide in Ukraine, documenting all the cases, uh, asking, well, society uh, to pay attention to this uh, aspect uh, too, and uh, they publish, already have published the first, but not the last issue, about current events in Ukraine. And we all know that something like this, like this could happen also elsewhere in Europe. And therefore, once more, we have to understand the necessity to protect our languages, uh, to promote these positive language attitudes both in native speakers or in second language speakers, and uh, to remember that uh, uh, wealth linguistic diversity is a value, and it's only up to us how to promote Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Ina, for your very interesting presentation. We do understand that each language matters. And thank you for reminding this very important issue for all of us. And uh, now we would like to invite uh, our colleagues from Faculty of Teacher Education, University of Zagreb, Croatia. And it's a great pleasure for us to welcome Professor uh, Vladimir Legetz, who is participating in several of our conferences already. And we met Professor in Lithuania uh, maybe two times, I guess. I don't remember exactly, but it was uh, every time. It's a great pleasure to meet you, Professor. And together with a uh, colleague, Professor Tomic Drazenko, you are uh, going to talk about values, mentality, and identity. So, Professor, uh, good morning to you. We hope um, you are ready. The floor is yours. So we hope for very interesting discussion after your uh, main insights. So, Professor, the word is for you. Thank you, Vita. Uh, for this nice introduction. Uh, unfortunately, Drajen Kotomic can't be with us, my colleagues, uh, so I'll be presenting the whole uh, lecture. Uh, you've heard the title from Visa. I just want to hear whether everybody can hear me. Yes, Professor, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. Um, it's a nice sunny day here where I am, 100 kilometers north of Zagreb. Uh, it's the anniversary of a very important historical date in Croatian history. On this day, we had a referendum 31 years ago, and more than 94% of the Croatian population voted for the independence of Croatia. So we broke away from Yugoslavia. Uh, as uh, all the Baltic nations, we also had to fight for our language. Uh, okay. And um, I want to take this opportunity to thank all the three Baltic states that they immediately recognized the independence of Croatia. Uh, so this author, Ivan Softa. His literary works were created in the world of hunger and subsequently in the world of confused values and in the struggle for mere survival. So with the change of regions when people had to flee because of hunger, values collapsed. And they were 
described in the works of this author. These works depict the lives of poor wage earners, wanderers, loafers and peasants during and after the First World War, with special emphasis on the Herzegovinian village. Herzegovina is one part of Bosnia and Herzegovina. In Bosnia, uh, three nations live, Serbs, Croats and Bosniaks, Muslim Bosniaks. Provocative speech on values and other moral topics is noticeable in all Softa's works, as well as subsequent reflection on the ethos in which Softa grew up. In this presentation, we will list and analyze the topics that Softa covered. Let us keep in mind that Softa is not an educated philosopher, but a talented person who has not been spoiled by life. This presentation will include the following things, biography, description of lit literary works, or we'll say something about famine, which was the backdrop where moral transformation took place. Then we'll say something about work and employment as a prerequisite for an honest life and the problems of the disappearance of values, for example, decent people became thieves, so theft as a denial of adopted moral norms, uh, the problems of the collapse of family and sexual morality. So, literary works by, first let me tell you something about the biography of Ivan Softa. We don't know exactly even the, his, the, bait, uh, the date of his birth, but we can assume that it was around 1906. He was born in Smokinje, a small town in Herzegovina. Uh, between 1920 and 1926, he worked in Croatia, in Slavonia, in Winkelsi Brickyard. Uh, that's the region in East Croatia, close to Vojvodina, to now part of Serbia and uh, Hungary. Uh, then he lost his job, so he wandered looking for work. He arrived in Zagreb in 1934, uh, and he got a permanent job, a manual job at the vegetable market. Uh, but later his talent was discovered and he worked in the city library. Uh, but in 1945, he disappeared in the aftermath of World War II as a young man. Here are li his literary works. There are 35 bibliographic units that can be found in National Library. Most important are three of his novels, On the Road, Days of Misery and Famine, and Restless Peace. Here you can see the years of publication and the names of the publishers. Uh, the novel, um, The D Days of Misery and Hunger, is the first novel according to the time described in it, so not according to the chronology of the appearance. So in this presentation, we are going to start from that novel. This is followed by the novel Restless Peace, and finally the novel On the Road, which contains the author's final views on the topic of values. The biggest challenge the author Softa faced was hunger. That is the basis on which all the action takes place in his novels. The famine caused by World War I reached its peak with the unprecedented drought in Herzegovina in 1917. So, at the same time, there were problems of poverty because of war uh, and the problems of lack of food because of drought. Softa was eight years old then. People survived by eating grass, grinding pressed refuse of fruit, peeling tree bark and baking bread from all these ingredients. 
the men were ashamed of themselves for not being able to feed their hungry children, and this is the start of the problem of value of husbands. Uh, on, the on this basis, Softa reflects on value attitudes. Uh, children used to be taken to Slavonia to avoid starvation. All the people also went to Slavonia, remember that's eastern part of Croatia, to work and earn some, not money, but they would be given some food, grain, wheat, oats or something like that. Down the, in the Hungary Herzegovina, they heard in disbelief about Slavonia, where even the poorest have white bread and bacon. This is a quotation from Days of Misery and Hunger. In this new environment, they, come, they encountered different values, and that's where problems start. Uh, in, and in the novel On the Road, the darkness of hunger prevails. The hungry protagonist wanders around, wondering if those who would give him a kilo of bread or two dinners to buy bread would go bust. Dinners was the currency in Yugoslavia between the two world wars and in later Socialist Federal Republic of Yugoslavia. And here is his fort of one of the characters. He was still looking at the bread and thinking how good it would be if he had warm bread. He moved his hands as if already holding a piece, breaking it, enjoying its softness and warmth. He drank his lips, removed his hands a little to warm them in the heat and steam rising from the freshly taken bread. Quotation from On the Road, page 11. Now, the problems with lack of unemployment, with lack of employment, so, and uh, bad employment that they got. Uh, all these people from Herzegovina were diligent. Work and diligence are an important component of life in Herzegovina. In addition to manually cultivating the sparse land and producing tobacco, they raised sheep and goats. But even with constant continuous work, it was hard to live. But now the problems on war and this drought the collapse of everything. Individuals used to go then overseas, so not only to Slavonia, but overseas, primarily to United States of America, but they would return. They earned some money there and then they would buy land upon their return to Herzegovina. Now, the problem of the values is here that um, uh, a nice quotation also about the problem of no job. When an, a comparison between an animal and a person, when an animal is no longer good enough for work, it is killed and the man gets something to eat when he works, only when he works. If he does not work, he starves to death. Uh, now, uh, about theft, so this is change of the strict moral of Ten Commandments. Here people in new regions start to uh, steal. Fast is one of the themes that run through all of Softa's novels. The reason for this is the traumatic experience from his childhood, when as an eight-year-old child he ate a neighbor's cabbage and uh, here is a quotation about the problem. Uh, he instinctively glanced at the cabbage with his eyes. Hunger had overwhelmed him to such an extent that his thoughts no longer understood anything. One thought began to haunt him and he was afraid of it, to take a spoon and to eat full. If only I would not be seen by anybody. So he didn't want to be seen. Uh, stealing uh, something else additionally about the problem of unemployment so people got used and so uh, not to work and to go and to beg uh, so just getting a short temporary work 
it seemed to them unworthy, so uh, they turned to begging. Uh, the problem here in this quotation is that people started to become afraid that the children would uh, become uh, would get used to stealing. You know how that Samadzic ended up when he was a little boy, he had nothing to eat and he learned to steal and when he grew up, he had enough, but he stole again. You should see what they are doing now. They quarrel with each other and grab a spoonful of porridge from each other. They lie to me and cheat on me every second way. Why should I cur now? So people started to get used to stealing, okay? When I was starving on the road, then they didn't know it, nor did they feed me. They threw us out onto the road and we've been trying to live as easily as we can. And why should I care about, uh, about what other people will say about me? Uh, so, in this pervasive hunger, as you've heard from this quotation, adults fear the children could learn to steal for life. Uh, Uh, so, in the softer's work on the road, and the dilemma arises to beg or to steal. The author presents several approaches to this issue. While some beg, others steal. Those who beg complain to those who steal that they endanger their existence because they will be, all be declared thieves. Those who steal respond that everyone goes through life for themselves and that others do not care about them either. When one of the characters was asked what he would say at home when they found out that he was stealing, he answered that they would not find it out. Another question about the possibility that they will bring him handcuffed to his home, what will his family say? He answered, why should I care when I was starving on the road and they didn't know it, nor did they feed me. They threw us out onto the road and we've been trying to live as easily as we can. And why should I care about what other people will say about me? Uh, family, women and wives, one of uh, the topics and the change of values there. While families in Herzegovina began to separate with the going of men to the war and then with the departure of children to get additional food in Slavonia, in Croatia, some of the families began to disintegrate with the end of the war. The novel On the Road briefly describes the breakup of several families that always occurred due to poverty and hunger. The main character wanted to realize some ideal of family with the woman he was on the road with, but he failed. So in new circumstances that didn't work, she rejected him and uh, uh, the female person stopped believing in love. The female characters from his native village that Softa carried in his memory and described in the novel day, The Days of Misery and Hunger are housewives, mothers, wives. They worked hard to feed the family earlier in the region, they took care of the house, they were, uh, they lived, they had, they were on good terms with their neighbors, they were in solidarity with them, they dug in their gardens and fields, they went to fetch water, they gave birth to and raised children, they felt all towards their husbands, they were pious and they cared about public opinion. Now all this starts to disappear. Uh, in the novel on the uh, uh, cruelty occurs with the collapse of family. Uh, husbands uh, start to beat the wives and here is a quotation uh, about a person who returned from America. He punched her in the back of the head. She fell, then he kicked her stomach. The children gathered against the wall and were all trembling. So this adds to the problem that children saw it again, the problem that they might start to imitate it once they become adults. And here a thought of a character 
oh, if I could only become invisible, untouchable, power, powerful as the evening darkness, then my father wouldn't beat me. Okay. Last that I'm going to address is the problem of sexual morality. Earlier, just about beatings, uh, it was also the case of uh, the stronger beating the weaker, so the boss beats apprentices, etc. Uh, in, in the novel Days of Misery and Hunger, not much space is given to the description of public morality related to sexuality. It was considered very rude to express love in public in any way. Two young people, Stanko and Yanya, said a short and secret goodbye in a garden by the roadside. They exchanged several discreet letters during the war. Quotation from page 33 from that novel, in the village of Softa's childhood, it was said with horror that in Slavonia every woman has a second husband. They were so immoral that they took to the streets and asked if somebody wanted them, and they recounted in disbelief that there were some who made a living from this business. Quotation from page 81. And uh, one more, uh, the quotation children start, uh, parents were afraid that every, that their children would become demoralized in new environment. And here a re reaction of a female character, what she said about the change of the morality. Uh, if someone wants to give rules for life, complain and spit on me that I do not live according to them, then he must give me opportunities to live within the limits of those rules. Who has the right today to ask me to live in accordance with those laws? They threw me out onto the road into the desert of life, which looks like throwing a lamb into a desert full of wolves and asked uh, uh, the person to save, the, the lamb to save its blood. Uh, Dear listeners, in this presentation, we have pointed out several examples of thinking about value topics. Of course, there are more. It could be said that the author Ivan Softa wants to point out the importance of the rut of life that carries and preserves public morals and customs due to external reasons, primarily due to hunger and general poverty. People jumped out of the rut because of the change of the region where they lived and they scattered in all directions and were shattered. They found themselves in an interworld with only one thing in common, an indefinite past full of violence and suffering, and another thing that they had in common, some wake hope of deliverance from cruel conditions. These characters have no future, moreover, they do not have names, but nicknames that evoke their condition of fear, and so the names of the characters are from the novels by soft up bone, falling sickness, so the term that was used for epilepsy in those days, suspicious right side, etc. Or the role they perform, publican, innkeeper, boss, aunt, father, mother, lawyer. They do not use their real names. A quotation about that, we cannot live the life that raised us for, so we will not use the names they gave us. We live another life and want other names. So. A very nice indication of the problem of the collapse of values. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, thank you for sharing uh, such uh, valuable insights from uh, the literary works uh, of Ivan Softa. Uh, very touchful, I guess, in the nowadays context. Our colleague from the Institute of Regional Development, Vilnius University Shule Academy. It will be our colleague Rita Surniejus, and he is going to present some insights about aspects of nationality and region in the music. So, dear colleague, the stage is yours. I will share the screen with the sound. Dear colleagues, it is my honor and pleasure to participate in the plenary session of the conference. Thank you very much. Uh, today I would like to introduce the music by Jonas Domarkas, the composer from Kleipeda, a Lithuanian town on the Baltic Sea. 
I will concentrate my presentation mostly on his works for the wind band because I have been studying these works for several years and also had an opportunity to collaborate with the composer by preparing new editions of some of his compositions. Jonas Domarkas, he was born on the 23rd of May 1934 in Liebgiri settlement. You can see the place on the screen. Uh, it's a Plunge district. And he spent his childhood in a small settlement of Kartana, situated in a picturesque surroundings at Minia River. Uh, Kartana is uh, several kilometers westwards from Liebgiri. In 1958, Domarkas graduated from the Lithuanian Conservatory as a music theoretician, yet he was not satisfied with one diploma. Encouraged by our composer Antanas Rekasius, he entered the conservatoire once more and studied composition with one of the most prominent Lithuanian composers and pedagogues, Eduardas Balsis. In 1970, Domarkas graduated from the conservatoire from 1960 to 1971, he taught here in Chaulet at Chaulet Pedagogical Institute, but after completing his composition studies, moved to Klaipeda. I will go back to the map. So this is Klaipeda, the town where Domarkas worked the better part of his life, and Palanga, here is his burial place. So he worked, uh, worked in Klaipeda, and from 1975 until his retirement in 2009, Domarkas worked as a professor in Klaipeda faculties of Lithuanian Conservatoire, Conservatoire that later became a part of Klaipeda University. Domarkas died on the 26th of January 20, 2020. He was 85 years old and he's buried, as I showed earlier, in Palanga Cemetery, in the same cemetery, by the way, where the prominent Lithuanian composer Balis Dvarionas, who was uh, Domarka's distant relative, is buried as well. Regrettably, I had no luck knowing Domarkas as a teacher during my study years in Klaipeda, yet I had an opportunity to play and conduct his wind band compositions during my studies. My collaboration with the composer began only in 2004 when I presented a paper in the Baltists conference at Klaipeda University and chose Domarkas works for band as a subject of my presentation. That was the first humble attempt to examine that field. Domarkas' creative legacy consists of compositions of different genres for different performing media piano, organ, chamber music, songs for solo voices, and choir and orchestral works. Generally, Domarkas uh, prefer to write instrumental music, especially orchestral music. Domarkas music is most, mostly dynamic and rhythmically active. It, it contains changing meters, polytonality, parallel dissonant intervals, non-tertial chords, etc. Generally, various means of the expanded tonality prevail. Uh, very few art music composers could be regarded as conveyors of humor. I think it's uh, 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 risky to joke for the serious composer because it, he or she will be disregarded as not a serious composer. Uh, whereas Domarkas reveals an extraordinary sense of humor in many of his works. Similarly to many of his contemporaries, Domarkas infused national traits in his creations, such as quotations of uh, the authentic, authentic folk songs or melodic inflections peculiar to the Lithuanian folk music. The composer especially widely exploited the folklore of his native Samogisha, Jamaitia region. The titles of instrumental compositions and the choice of song lyrics also frequently contain national coloring. Manifestation of folk music are abundant in the music for the wind, wind band as well. Domarkas works for wind band could be regarded as a specific or even exclusive phenomenon in Lithuania music, I would like to say. Domarkas himself ranked those creations equally valuable to his other art music compositions. Thus, he rejected the opinion, it's common in Lithuania even nowadays, of course it was common in Domarkas' time, that wind band is only a second-rate musical medium for the utilitarian purpose. 
the originality, innovation and professionalism of Domarka's works for band reminds serious, often even academic treatment of wind music in the Western countries. I dare assume that concerning his compositions for the wind band, Domarkas was ahead of his own time, especially if compared with the band's repertoire that predominated in Lithuania at that period. On the other hand, Domarkas' music of 1980s in general deviated, at least slightly, from traditional standards of elite music and turned towards, let us say, democratization. In his interview for the daily newspaper Kleiper, the 21st of May 2004, composer said, quote, There is too much of the serious music. It's too grave, too sophisticated, and contains various innovations. It is not interesting for the ordinary people, quote end. In the beginning of the so in the beginning of the 80s, student ensembles of Kleiper the faculties lacked original Lithuanian repertoire. So Domarkas responded to their demands and created several works for choir, ensembles, and, of course, wind band. Yet those works are created positively professionally, so it is not easy to perform them. Non-typical means of expression even now make some conductors crouch while encountering the unusual rhythms and... Oh, sorry. I will briefly characterize Domarka's two largest works for the band based on folk melodies. The first composition is para Paraphrase Stasio Shimkov's Denutemomis, paraphrase on songs by Stasis Shimkus. Shimkus was a prominent Lithuanian composer of the interwar period. Two folk, folk songs arranged by Shimkus for the voice and piano are used in paraphrase. You can see the names uh, uh, on the screen. Uh, and the third theme is the original song by Shimkus. Uh, you also can see as written on the screen. In Lithuanian, they are Vaivargia Vargia and Palanki Palanki. And the uh, original author song is Tupasaki Kimansa Lugiele. Three versions, three variants of the paraphrase created in different years exist. The first version, it was composed in 1986 and performed in 1987, it was a year of Shimko's 100th anniversary. Later, when times changed, I mean when Soviet Union collapsed and Lithuania became independent, in 1991, the composer Antanas Rekashus, yes, the same the same gentleman who urged Domarkas to study composition with Balsis, uh, acquainted Domarkas with a musician from the United States. Uh, he was a representative of United States Air Force Band, who visited Lithuania at that time. That man suggested, suggested actually he commissioned Domarkas to compose a work for this particular band. United States Air Force Band. Thus, the second version of the paraphrase appeared. The subsequent events are rather curious because the band received Domar Casco, however, never performed it. Why? Later, one of the American band conductors discovered me the truth. The a representative, so to say, of the United States Air Force Band actually was not accredited by his authorities to commission any music. So, although the band received Domarkas Co, its authorities presumably decided not to expand their repertoire with a composition by the composer from the country that had only recently appeared on the world's map. That's, of course, only my assumption. <laughs> In any case, the premiere of the work did not take place at that time. On the other hand, Domarkas received the fee for this composition, the authorities of the band acted honestly. Uh, the fate of the imposter commissioner is unknown. In 2006, I suggested performing this later version of the paraphrase to Dr. James Saker, the director of the Symphonic Wind Ensemble at Nebraska University in Omaha. Dr. Saker performed it with great success in 2009, at first in Omaha, later in Michigan University, likely in some other places as well. Moreover, Seika edited the score by slightly changing the orchestration and adding, adding more parts of the pitched percussion. 
Besides, Suike had to change the original title word paraphrase to fantasy. Because for Americans, the word paraphrase means the adaptation of another composer's creation, but not an original work. This edition by James Saker is the third and the last one. It has been recorded in the anthology of Lithuanian wind bands issued in 2013. I suggest listening to the excerpt of this recording. The performer is the Lithuanian army band conducted by Major Agidius Alishauskas. I also have two more recordings. One is by Central Michigan University, another by uh, Nebraska University band, band, yet because of the patriotic reasons, I chose the Lithuanian one. Another creation for the band of a large scale is Jemetishkoi Rhapsodia, Samagishin Rhapsody. It was created in 1980, six years earlier than Paraphrase, Paraphrase Fantasy. It is one of the first works for wind band by Domarkas in general. But although written comparatively early, Rhapsody is the most innovative and complex of all Domarkas works for band. It contains complicated harmony, non tertian chords, Fourth chords, for instance, Domarkas was very, fo very fond of, of the fourth chords. Polytonality is used in many episodes, sometimes in a rather drastic way. Also changing meters and polyrhythm. The thematic background is the melodies of three Samogitian folk songs. You can see their names on the screen. Domarkas ingeniously elaborated these melodies alongside his original themes. With the consent of the composer in 2013, I started to work on editing this composition, intending to publish the score. I spent a lot of time searching for the manuscript. It's what is interesting that I looked in the archives in Kleipeda. I asked persons who could have dealt with that score, but it mysteriously disappeared. Then, Jonas Domarkas remembered that he had sent the score to the leading Lithuanian wind band, Trimitas. He contacted Trimitas administration and soon received a heap of instrumental parts, not the score, because the score itself was not found in Trimitas archives as well. Very interesting case. Two scores both disappeared. Although they should have had it for sure. 
So I could not do anything else but put one part after another by using the digital sheet music editor and after days of work, the reconstructed score was completed. I suppose that remitters never performed the work. The basis of my assumption is a multitude of mistakes in the parts they had sent. To correct these mistakes was a serious task. Rhapsody is not a traditional wind band work. It's, its means of musical expression are much more complicated than in fantasy on themes by Shimkus. Therefore, sometimes it was difficult to identify if one or another note is erroneous or maybe such harsh dissonance in, is in its proper place. Fortunately, Domarkas himself indicated the correct notes in unclear cases. I also, also slightly changed the orchestration in some places, of course, with the endorsement of the composer. Ultimately, the score was completed and issued in Cholet University Press in 2014. Unfortunately, I do not have a good recording of the work. The recording uh, produced during the premiere of the new version in Jarvempiaia, Finland in 2014 is not of sufficient quality. Yet, in 2004, Domarkas created a version of the Somogician Rhapsody for the Symphony Orchestra that was performed at his 17th anniversary celebration concert. These two compositions, I mean for the wind band and for symphony orchestra, have many common features, some places are almost identical. However, each of them is specific, composed according to the peculiarities of different performing media. Therefore, both band and orchestra versions should be regarded as independent compositions. Now I can present only an excerpt of the symphonic version of Rhapsody recording during the concert performance. The except contains the development of the song Mummy Let's Kill a Cock. The performer is played by the symphony orchestra conductor Stasis Domarkas, a distant relative of the composer. At the end of my presentation, I would like to mention one more facet of Domarka's activity. During most of his life, he expressed himself in another branch of arts, carving of wood and stone. Mostly chamber sculptures and creations of applied and decorative art. Since 1985, Domarkas was a member of Lithuanian Association of Folk Art. Obviously, wood, stone, folk art of his native Samogisha, and a great love for the Baltic seaside were the most important sources of the composer's inspiration. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor. And now you can feel free to ask questions. You talked about stereotypes and what would be your recipe that you could give to worldwide audience the best thing to fight stereotypes about indigenous languages and the second question if i can oh you can choose again um, uh, now you mentioned all the things that are done uh, with the modern technology for the survival of languages i wonder whether these uh, indigenous languages exist on Google Translator and what could be done about it because this is 
a very important thing for the survival of languages, according to some linguists. Were you able to hear me? Yes, yes. Okay. Thank you very much for these questions. So, it's impossible to eliminate stereotypes at all because they are grounded in general principles of uh, human cognition and uh, they help us to understand uh, the world, uh, to include all phenomena in different categories, therefore they could have some positive impact too. But uh, uh, we may uh, at least to try to eliminate negative stereotypes, especially concerning uh, other uh, peoples belonging to different social group, including uh, ethnic group and uh, linguistic group. And uh, how to do this? Uh, first of all, it's information, information about world's linguistic diversity, its origins and its significance for our common cultural heritage. Uh, second, it's uh, legislation. Unfortunately, we have to use uh, this instrument too. So hate speech, of course, is forbidden. Discrimination along uh, linguistic grounds um, is forbidden too. And uh, the third factor, uh, it's, uh, let's say, different ways how to form positive uh, attitudes and uh, to demonstrate uh, the common sociolinguistic principles against language maintenance uh, irrespective of the number of uh, its speakers. And uh, that's the issue we are working along uh, for more than 30 years. I speak about uh, the Baltic uh, languages and therefore uh, we, as I told in my presentation, try to find all the necessary ways how to use global initiatives uh, in order to promote uh, this understanding uh, within general public. Uh, will we succeed? Uh, uh, how to say? Maybe not in a full extent, but I sincerely believe uh, that uh, information education uh, could do a lot. And uh, the second uh, question uh, was about, so please uh, remind me. It's about Google Translator. Oh, yeah. and the sense of, okay. yes. Thank uh, you very much for an excellent first uh, uh, question, answer to the first question. Okay, I'm really satisfied, okay. Uh, Thank you. Uh, uh, it depends, uh, uh, because so-called indigenous languages are uh, very different too in uh, uh, numbers of their speakers. Some of them uh, even um, have no written form, and uh, unfortunately uh, most of them are scriptless languages. Therefore, so it's taken for granted they couldn't exist in cyberspace. Mm -hmm. and uh, in education too, and it's one of the main reasons why they are under threat. But other languages, and uh, uh, for instance, the three indigenous languages officially recognized by European institutions as Livonian, um, uh, Cornish, um, uh, Frisian, uh, maybe Breton, uh, maybe even Welsh, uh, 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 are represented in uh, some translation tools, not only in Google, but if you visit the homepage of our Livonian Institute, uh, uh, you'll see a lot of digital tools uh, uh, demonstrating that irrespective of, let's say, three tens of speakers, language could use all uh, these uh, digital tools for uh, its uh, protection and maintenance. Thank you. Professor Vladimir, can I ask you a question? Yes, please. It's about values and identity and how it was influenced by the historical tragedy, uh, tragedies of societies. Do you think that the time can heal the wounds of such tragedies of society and to return previous values to nations? What is your insights from literature review? Thank you, thank you. Uh, I'm not a specialist in literature, but uh, yes, I can say. Uh, um, something about values, yes, uh, it 
they can be the wounds can be healed and that's the good news and um, efforts should be done by education institutions but uh, also by psychologists theologians and mm, many other people okay specialists and there is hope for that provided that uh, also no problems uh, exist in legislation okay uh, yes thank you very much professor i do believe that uh, sometimes this uh, current conditions can create such problems like you mentioned like mm -hmm. uh, thieves beating family members threatening others and so on but i do believe that uh, society has the possibility and the hope to go out of the tragedy, to go out of the hunger, poverty, and after this to return the values back to their lives. So thank you very much, Professor, for, for those insights. I would like to ask our colleague Ritis. Ritis, could you join me because I, I want our colleagues would see you. Uh, my question is about Professor Domarkas and his um, creation. Um, you mentioned that he is was saying about that innovations are needed to the music yeah because uh, ordinary or traditional music is not interesting for ordinary people uh, actually it's vice versa because he said that the music which uh, that was uh, created by composers in at, at the time and of course in modern times as well uh, it is too sophisticated it is too difficult for ordinary people to understand therefore he decided to go by the along the path so called it's a german term gebrauchsmusik it's a, a kind of music which actually professional but on the other hand it's not so difficult to understand for people who are not musicians it's not avant-garde music so to say thank you very much and uh, you mentioned that folk music or folk songs were one of the main sources for encouragement to create the music do you see some other sources of encouragement of music creation for this professor music uh, so uh, I just, uh, as i said at the end of my presentation of course it's a nature he was very fond of walking along the seaside in the uh, forest he was uh, even in his later years he was a uh, good bicycle rider he went from from Klaipeda to Palanga, it's 30 kilometers, and he was almost 80. So it was, it was impressions from nature, impressions from from folk songs, and of course from his contemporary composers as well. So these are a multitude of sources. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, luckily, we had the, the Dr. Yuris coming back to the room. If you could uh, be so kind to join me, as we have Professor Vladimir. Uh, he has some questions for you, so Dr. Yuris is joining me, and Professor Vladimir, we are waiting for your questions. Hello, uh, nice to see you. Um, in that urgent question, when you ended the, your presentation, there was a question about the situation in Finland. Now, my question, as far as I know, Finnish communists fought against the Red Army uh, in that uh, Finnish uh, Soviet war, but I don't know anything about the reaction of Latvian communists when Latvia was invaded. Did they fight against the Red Army? Mm, uh, in the interwar period, you mean? Yeah, well, uh, uh, when uh, in, in 1939, when uh, Latvia was invaded by the Red Army. Nineteen thirty-nine, uh, Communist Party in Latvia in interwar period is a very um, not strong. It's, it's a very small marginal group okay. uh, because uh, the Latvian uh, special uh, special pol police, uh, Latvian police, um, uh, against uh, um, against the Communist Party uh, was successful. Yes, very, very. Uh, he, he uh, they did uh, not strong power. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And 
thank you, thank you. What argument in in interwar period? Thank you. Oh, the hand of Moscow. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, that's quite natural. But um, now, with the benefit of hindsight, when we look back, uh, what can we say about the uh, worst failure that was done with the security in the interwar period? Uh, was there any possibility for Latvia and other Baltic states to have been saved and not in successfully invaded by uh, the Red Army and uh, the Nazi Germany? Um, question is different. Uh, question is difficult and uh, different too because Uh, if you if you if you ask about the Latvian was a safe uh, our region not a safe region in the uh, interwar period because because it's uh, uh, it there was a very geopolitical interest from the Soviet Union from the Germany uh, from the Poland too a little bit but the from Poland too and uh, earlier or later uh, this interests were be struggled in the in the Latvia and the in the Lithuania and uh, in the in the Estonia too in the in Lithuanian Lithuanian situation was a, a very difficult ease because uh, Lithuanian was a conflict with the Poland but mm -hmm. Latvia uh, think that Poland is a big friend of Latvia Estonia too. Uh, it's a very uh, it's a very difficult situation in geopolitical uh, in Latvia in, in Baltic in Baltic region, and uh, I can't say safe situation. I can't say. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you, Dr. Yuris, for your answers, and thanks to our participants and key speakers who gave uh, wonderful insights of the own research as well as feedback for other presenters. So we would like to thank to all uh, those who were connecting to this uh, scientific international conference face-to-face -face as well as online. It was our great pleasure to have you all. We hope Professor Vladimir and Professor Ina, we will see you face-to-face -face next year in the 12th conference of the region in May. So uh, we would like to invite you and others to take a part already. We hope that situation will be better according to pandemics as well as war, and we will be able to celebrate this conference together. So, dear colleagues, I would like to thank to all participants as well as key speakers. Thank you for sharing your scientific insights, and we hope for a um, very fruitful working group um, uh, sessions, and we uh, wish uh, all of participants to have very nice time and interesting discussions. So thank you all of the, you and uh, let's hope to see uh, uh, each other face to face next year in the 12th International Interdisciplinary Scientific Conference, the region, the culture, history and the language. Thank you all for your nice participation and see you soon in the next working group. <coughs>